and this is some of her work on scarabs. So, in terms of what are the big drivers of beetle evolution for the last 20 years, we've known exactly what's going on. Angiosperms did it. Smoking gun's done. Brian Farrell proved it in a seminal and entirely data free paper published in the It has since been invoked for a large number of insect co radiation stories, so notably within beetle families, uh, but also Lepidopteran bees, so we're moving out into other herbivores, and then somewhat less um, apparently in things like mantids and ants that aren't really herbivores at all and yet do seem to show a peak of diversification around 100 million years ago and so it gets blamed on angiosperms even in the absence of a persuasive mechanism. So we're still struggling for decent explanations for non-herbivorous -herb insects in general and beetles in particular but interestingly in big scale time phylogenies such as the one from Alfred Vogler's lab, we do see peaks of diversification of about 100 million years for a wide range of groups that aren't herbivorous. So one thing that Nicole was interested in was working on, was working on this issue of generalised drivers in beetle evolution getting beyond angiosperms. And so for this, and in addition to the fact that Tom Weir had convinced her that dung beetles were God's gift to um, systematics, <laughs> she spent a lot of time working on scarabs. And they really are a good model system for looking at this herbivore or non-herbivore system because within the family Scarabaeidae we have two um, dietary defined clades. There's the Phytophagus clade consisting of the Melolonthines, the leaf beetles, and some more specialised families, the Tonyalins, Donastylins, Rulines, and the Saprophagus clade consisting of the Aphidines and then the Dung beetles, the Scarabions. In addition, within each of these two clays, there's been parallel evolution of specialisation. And by this, we don't mean host specialisation, rather tissue specialisation. So there are generalist folivores in, in the melolonthines, but then there are specialists. The other three subfamilies are specialists on plant tissues that only really occur in angiosperms, so petals, fruit, um, and root tubers. Similarly, in the, in the um, saprophores, there are the aphidines are generalist saprophages, whereas the dung beetles are specialised on a particular type of rotting material, that is vertebrate dung. And when we started, there was a fairly limited um, phylogenetic data. There was one paper from Andrew Smith, which was kind of sketchy um, in terms of the um, quality of the phylogeny that was produced. But so far this year has been high summer for um, scarab phylogenies. Um, we'll deal with both of those later on. Fairly standard methods, so she did a big phylogeny, 450 species representing all major groups within the superfamily um, Scarabioidea. Within Scarabaeidae, there are 400 species representing approximately a quarter of all the genera in this family, so it's a very good data set. Five genes, so there's a lot of data in that. Relatively standard methods for inferring a tree, and then she dated those trees and inferred diversification rates with, again, what are fairly standard methods for these sorts. So, the tree. It's a very nice tree. Um, Scarabioidea is monophyletic. Scarabaeidae is monophyletic. Two very good things. We get the Phytophagus clay, monophyletic as, as expected, and the Saprophagus clay, um, as expected, monophyletic. Melolonthine is not monophyletic, so it's rendered paraphyletic by the other three, other three subfamilies. Again, this has been suspected in the lit and talked about in the literature plenty. Dynastines render root lines non-monophyletic, again, has been proposed. And up in the saprophores, <coughs> monophyletic um, uh, scarabioni, slightly non-monophyletic apodyne, but that might be an artifact of the fairly limited number of apodynes that we have in the tree. So the next thing she did was she got dates on these and constructed lineage through time plots. So if you're not familiar with these, these start out at the um, stem age where there's nothing in the group and then you accumulate lineages across the tree up to the extent diversity which is 100%. And so we, so the crown group origins for the melolonthines at first about 130, 140 million years. So well before, well back into the Cretaceous, probably around the times of the very earliest angiosperm, certainly well predating the big angiosperm bump. But their initial peak in diversification is 95 so yeah, core territory for the ecological takeover of the angiosperms from non-angiosperm plants. Within the specialised angiosperm phytophage, phytophage so dynastines, cetonians, realines, kind of similar story, the origins are later. So they're not overlapping in time, the origins are significantly later than the melolonthines. Their initial peak, while later, is still broadly consistent with, um, with the angiosperm explosion. But interestingly, they also overtake the, species, the um, diversification
replication rate of the Melville Long Thines about 70 to 80 million years ago. So this is interesting because extant diversity of Melville Long Thines is about 40% of scarabs. These three subfamilies are about 30%, but they start earlier and they go at a reasonable rate. So even though the recent diversification of the specialists is higher, they don't actually overtake them in terms of total species numbers. <coughs> Putting in the scarabions, same story again. Origins somewhat later than the melalonthines, but not hugely. Initial peak of diversification, latest of the latest of the lot, but still broadly consistent with ages. So this is well back into Cretaceous. This is well before mammals. This is core dinosaur territory. Their subfamily radiations, core dinosaur territory. So what we think is happening is that is one dung beetles are evolving in association with dinosaur dung. And, the, and their radiation is being driven by the dietary change of dinosaurs from eating non-angiosperms to angiosperms. Angiosperms produce a more useful ecological dung type for dung beetles to live in. Now, the idea that dung beetles eat dinosaur poo is contentious. So there is evidence both for and against. The four evidence are coprolites that have trace fossils, these little burrows that have been scrounged through fossilised dinosaur poo well before, well core dinosaur territory, well before the, um, any, any mammals are around. Trace fossils are endlessly debated as to what actually made them, but they are broadly consistent with dung beetles. The anti-crowd use extant diversity as their evidence. So very few extant dung beetles occur in reptile or bird dung. The idea being that the uric acid that is produced in the dung of all non-mammals is somehow toxic to dung beetles. <coughs> Therefore, has, uh, that the dung beetles must have arisen in mammal dung with the, um, with the uh, evolutionary um, innovation of not putting your urine, your, um, your urine products into your dung, separating it out, thus creating a, a more useful product. Now, the age of mammals is similarly contentious. So the molecular dating analysis pushes it back well into, into the Cretaceous versus the fossil evidence that has it occurring well after the end Cretaceous extinction event. Either way, the fossil evidence suggests that mammals were not a major part of the flora, uh, sorry, the fauna, until after, after end of the Paleogene, so after the Cretaceous event. So either way, even if they existed, they weren't a huge portion of, portion of the fauna. And what was around of mammals in the Cretaceous were little insectivores. And there are very few extant dung beetles that consume insectivore dung. Now I'm aware that this argument is very similar to this argument, except that there, are, there were little insectivores running around then, and there are little insectivores running around now. So why would you evolve on one group and then abandon them unless you were forced to? Now, why did dung beetles abandon dinosaurs? Well, quite simply, they went extinct. So there's a very good reason to abandon eating dinosaur dung when it's no longer present. Insectivores cruise straight through the ecology boundary and keep going on to the present, and yet dung beetles don't really like insectivore dung. So I don't think they ever really If we go back to the lineage through time plots, we mark in the end Cretaceous event for the melalonthines. We see a small um, flat spot. So in lineage through time plots, you're only dealing with extant diversity. So extinctions show up as flat spots. You, you know, intuitively you'd think they show up as declines. They don't. You can't actually map extinctions onto lineage through time plots. So what you see are flat spots. So there's a flat spot for the, mel the melalonthines. Specialist angiosperms just go straight through it, don't appear to um, have a problem with the NKPG, which seems counterintuitive, but I've got some other evidence that might explain, might explain that. We'll talk about that later. Now when we look at the dung beetles, nice map, uh, mass extinction through there. Trust me, inferring these things is not as simple as drawing fingers across lines. There is actual statistics behind this, but to illustrate it, I'll just draw fingers around like this. The other line of evidence is from these um, clay diversification rates. This is using the method of moments from Mike Sanderson. And what we find is that the diversification rates and the total diversity are in no way, shape, or form age dependent. So the oldest families, Coprini, Dichrodomini, Campanini, uh, have, uh, have less diversity than the Orthogeni, which, which is 20 million years young, uh, younger than those three oldest clays. So unless something's happening, to increase in Thophagene uh, diversification rates or to reduce the diversification rates of the other ones, the oldest group should have significantly higher numbers of species. It does not. So something, the Thophagene who evolved right around the KPG, uh, the 
most diverse um, uh, tribe, they have a very high diversification rate. Similarly, the two um, tribes that evolved after the KPGs, that's the Sisyphene and the Faenini, have much higher average diversification rates than the average for the family. So basically, all extant um, dung beetles are largely associated with mammal dung. So mammal dung is a ubiquitous thing, all these families can utilise it, and yet only some of them seem to have gone crazy with mammal dung. And they seem to be the ones who are younger. And they seem to be the ones that are fr date from around the KPG or after the KPG. So this is all consistent, to my mind, with extinction in KPG. And so basically what happens is we lose really big dung beetles. So we think of dinosaurs as enormous creatures. There were always a range of dinosaur <coughs> sizes, herbivorous dinosaurs down to things the size of a chicken. We lose all the really big guys, the really small guys can get into, get into the mammal dung, which isn't hugely different from the dung that was produced by small dinosaurs, and so they become the ancestors of extant diversity. Now, if, all, if you're keeping up with your literature, you'll say, that's great, Stephen, but, some, but Alfred Vogel's group just disproved everything you said and proved that scarab beetles arise only with mammals. Uh, this paper here, I can go into a um, long, involved, and sophisticated analysis of comparing our two studies, or I could just tell you why they're wrong, <laughs> and that's what I'll do. <laughs> they have less species. There's not looking at it. It's not clear that they've missed any significant, uh, significant lineages, or that they've cooked the books in any way. But flat out, there's just less species there. There are less genes, so there's less data to work on, and what that adds up to is a is a less plausible phylogeny. So they get non monophyletic scarabaeidae, they get non sister groups between the ecological clades, they get fairly poor nodal support across things. So there's a bunch of areas whereby the phylogeny doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and we can put it down to less quality data. The biogeography is also less plausible in, in, um, in their scenario in, on the basis of the dates. So there's several Gondwana um, distributed uh, dung beetle tribes that in their that in their dates are 10 to 20 years, mil, billion years younger than the separation of the cogent bits of, bits of Gondwana. It's hard to see how they swam across those vast expanses of water given that, well, they don't now. So the real problem lies in their use of the fossils. They mostly use crown group fossils. So all of their fossil dates, are <coughs> fossil calibration, sorry, are consistent with our tree they just come up with a much younger date because they are mid-stem ages. Either um, stem ages are very old, scarab fossils, most of which they say, oh, well, we can't place them um, well, even though Frank Krell is very clear that they are well-defined to the families that they're assigned to. And they also are mid-stem ages that are inferred from other phylogenetic trees, such as their own previous work in the home of our table. So they're wrong. They're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. <laughs> they missed the dinosaur dung beetle mass extension because they infer the age of dung beetles to be much younger than when dinosaurs. So KPG impact on overall fossil diversity is held to be fairly low. This is Conrad Lavendera's work, mostly on, uh, again, trace fossils, mostly in, um, in leaves. So there are no family level extinctions. There's regional <coughs> level um, turnover and fullness, but it's fairly modest. Certainly it's nothing on the scale of what we, what we associate with the KPG, which is really all about that said, the KPG has been invoked as a reason for mass extinction of a cryptic mass extinction events in uh, butterflies, Psylocope, and bees. They're inferred using methods pretty similar to the ones that I've showed you previously. Now, these guys proposed there was a mass extinction of angiosperms, and that drives a mass extinction of butterflies and Psylocope. So, what do we know about KPG impact on angiosperms? Again, fossil evidence is it's modest. Very few families go extinct globally, and there is regional turnover of families in general. The impact site is in modern-day Mexico. It really does a number on North American flora. The impact declines the further you move away from Mexico, because it's a fireball, right? Okay. So North America gets incinerated. France, bugger all happens for millions of years. So angiosperm impact really modest. Certainly not a mass extinction sufficient to really get to these ones. So if we go to our groups, in the specialist angiosperms, we do not see evidence of a mass extinction in KPG. They sail straight through it. There's not even a deflection to the L uh, lineage through time plots. Well, on pause for maybe 10 million years. 
the scarabions, we have a cryptic mass extinction, but it's one we can explain because their food source, dinosaurs, went away. Angiosperms didn't go away, and so it's actually hard to invoke angiosperms as the reason for declines of butterflies and bees at that point. So we're finally beginning to get models that link angiosperm and insect evolution at a remove. So Dwayne McKenna's recently published a paper on staphyliniforms and that angiosperms probably contributed to greater leaf litter diversity starting from 100 million years ago and that that drove staphyliniforms. Similarly, in this study, we posit the um, existence of angiosperm-enriched dinosaur dung, a sort of super dung that turbocharges du that dung beetle evolution. Um, right until the point that the dinosaurs go away and the dung beetles go extinct. So, funded by lots of people because we've been doing this for a long time. Thank you.